Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Beyond Compliance. This is the show that aims to illuminate some of the best practices and solutions to some of the toughest challenges and industry trends that are impacting process manufacturing today. So I know we're all here to find out where manufacturers can prevent future headaches and save some thousands of dollars on digitization projects. But before we dive in, for those of you who are new to this program, Beyond Compliance is brought to you by Safety Chain. They're the developers of the industry's only end-to-end -end digital plant management platform, specifically designed for process manufacturers to unite plant production, quality, and compliance in order to improve yield, maximize productivity, and of course, ensure compliance. Now, just some quick housekeeping items. First, we've muted all attendee mics, but you can save your comments and questions at the end because we will have some time for Q&A. And yes, we are recording this session and we will be sending a link to the replay as well as the presentation slides to you later today, so keep a look out. All right, let's go ahead and meet today's speaker, Arthur Leshevsky, whose 12 years experience in manufacturing digitization has led him to become the Vice President of Operations for Mode 40, whose mission is to help manufacturers turn IT into profit through operations, engineering, and technology consulting, specifically around digital transformation projects, which is perfect for what we're talking about today. So Arthur, welcome to Beyond Compliance. Now, I think it's safe to say that you've seen it all when it comes to whether a digitization project will succeed or not. So it's great to have you on today. Awesome, thanks a lot for that introduction. Yeah, maybe maybe before we jump ahead here, just a, just a quick bit about my background. Um, as, as kind of been alluded to, I've been working in manufacturing for about 12 years now, uh, mainly through consultants and integrators. Um, I've been doing everything from deploying solutions on the plant floor, I'm an engineer by trade, all the way through uh, managing engineers, project management, sales, client, selects, client success and solutions architecting, and then all the way through product development, uh, directing a team for product development. Um, you know, in my my personal experience, for those on the call that that come from, you know, uh, I imagine most do from the manufacturing world, a uh, lot of experience in packaging, liquid process, um, kind of traditional MES across multiple verticals, and and general networking, which is going to be a part of our focus today. So, just a little bit of background about Mode 40, which is the the company I work for, and uh, I, I lead the operations team on. Um, some of you may be familiar with the automation pyramid. So what we do in mode 40 is we work across this pyramid all the way down from ERP to the individual device sensors and actuators. Um, we do have a heavy focus on the MES and the sort of central supervisory and data acquisition aspects uh, of, of that pyramid. Uh, but we do in-house have uh, consultants, we do integration services, lean training, software development, all of that with our in-house staff um, and kind of go all the way up, like I said, uh, to the ERP point where we would interface and pull things like master data and everything else that's, uh, that you guys are keeping in there. So as a, as a focus of what we're gonna be talking about today, kind of going back and looking at this pyramid, um, we are gonna put a, a heavier focus on how are we gonna connect these things together Digitization and, and factory digitization is all about connections. What are the things that you need to think about before we start the journey? How do we architect things in a way that support future initiatives? And where are the gotchas going to be and, and the pitfalls? On that pyramid specifically, we're going to look at what is traditionally uh, called the OT manufacturing side, the OT manufacturing network. There is a whole component there with IT, how you integrate into uh, potentially off-prem systems, other business-minded systems, but really uh, the focus here is going to be more on those things that are a little bit more nebulous that exist on the uh, on the manufacturing floor. So let's uh, let's jump into it. So you know, you might be thinking, I just mentioned that word, OT networks, and and how how does that actually relate to the people on this call here? How does it relate to me as a as an audience member? So in my experience, about 90%, 95% of my clients are missing some component of something we're gonna to cover today, which really helps streamline projects and digitization initiatives. So a common thing that a lot of, I, I hear from people is, well, 
you know, kind of the misconception is I don't have a manufacturing network. And if that's the case, that's okay. You may not have that today, but you will likely have that in the future. How am I supposed to do this? We don't have an IT person. That's okay too. The, the goal of this presentation is to focus on the thing you can do without IT or an OT expert. It's not a problem for us yet, exactly. It doesn't have to be a problem yet, or it may be. We don't have a budget. What we're gonna cover here is good practices and standards. It's mostly free and it's things you can be thinking about now and implementing without a lot of uh, expenditure. We have somebody that handles it. We have a guy, we have that guy that comes in and does things. That's awesome. That doesn't mean that we we don't uh, we can't provide additional guidance and uh, creating a way to uh, to prepare ourselves for the future. Um, and one of the common ones is, well, I, I don't know anything about networking. I'm I'm just you know I focus on on other parts of this. It's it's easy. I promise. Nothing here requires a degree in networking. Nothing requires a uh, extensive amount of experience. These are heavily based on standards and bookkeeping things you can be doing to prepare yourself. A lot of the things here are going to be extremely simple and in my experience, depending on scale, could save up to $100,000 in the future as you get to those points where you're digitizing. So before we start, because uh, we're going to put a focus on digitization and the backbone of that, which is OT networking, we're going to do about a 30 second crash course on OT networks and, and what are they comprised of. So what, what will you typically see on the plant floor? You're going to have some kind of machines and those machines are going to have a PLC cabinet. It's usually a controller of some sort. It doesn't really matter what that PLC is. It's just a controller that controls your machines. And then there's some kind of external IO and network switches and things that are used to interface with physical things in the real world with electrical signals usually. Sometimes there's an additional panel there that uh, for the bigger systems that you may have installed that's going to have additional IO that's connected back to your PLC. Some of you may have SCADA computers or other types of PCs on the plant floor. Uh, there may be another machine that it's interconnected with, another PLC. And then sometimes there's external switches that aren't necessarily inside the cabinet. There's another IT closet, OT cabinet, it may have firewalls, it may have servers, it may be interconnected to something, or maybe not. That, that may not necessarily exist. For this presentation, what we're going to do is we're going to categorize what we see here on this page as a network segment. And, and the reason for that will be clear on the next slide. So when you go into facilities, oftentimes, regardless of where people are in their maturity life cycle with networking, with digitization, you're going to see multiple network segments. You're going to see islands of automation where one machine communicates with another, but nothing else. And your network segments might look something like this. They may be a process line number one, process line number two, packaging line number one, and maybe some utilities, BMS. And of course, you could have hundreds of network segments depending on how large your facility is. All that in the perfect world would connect back to some kind of cabinet, some kind of centralized OT network switch, but that, that's not always the case. Um, we're we're going to assume you maybe have something like this, maybe you don't, it doesn't really matter at this point. What we see a lot of is something along these lines where you don't have any sort of interconnected interconnectivity between these segments, or maybe there's a few, but not all of it's connected and there's no logical way this has been done. This has been done on a per need basis. So the next step is somebody usually comes to me and we're in the state of OT network of this, of what that is. And they say, well, I wanna, I wanna digitize. So what are, what are common digital initiatives, and I'm sure everyone on this call has some in mind, OEE, production planning, quality, NES, ERP integration, I want to put master data on the floor, IoT data, analytics, I want to see visualization, I want to just see what's happening on the floor, I don't even want to analyze what's happening, I just want a view of what's happening, there's a million ways to, to look at it. So again, kind of kind of going into what that is, what what is digitization, and what what creates a digitization initiative? I usually think of it as four things. There's some kind of software component to it, which is the on-premise or potentially off-prem in the cloud, in some data center, whatever it is. In order for a digital transformation, a digitization should be successful, you need an output. You, you, you can't just collect data for the sake of collecting data. So what does an output look like? Reports, sometimes there's virtual information, OEE, inventory, you can interconnect with purchasing tools in sky's the limit, and I'm sure all of you have seen those 
outputs that you get. Also, one of my favorites is, of course, the direct process manipulation. So you can tie back these digitization initiatives to actively change what's happening on the plant floor during the manufacturing process. The next thing is, of course, process data. You need an input. You need something that goes into that. That can be manually collected. That could be putting scheduling in. That could be collecting quality data from the floor on a, on a piece of paper. That could be collecting efficiency through paper. That could be uh, on an iPad. That could be done through an operator somehow. The other way is through a machine interface. So the other, the other method is you connect a cable or some method into the machine and you can pull that data direct. And finally, there's a data transport. So it could be manual again, you're, you're moving things off a piece of paper into an Excel spreadsheet and then, and then crunching that data, which again, Excel is everybody's favorite. And, uh, and then there's the network component, that backbone that we've already reviewed. So, in this presentation, we're going to assume that we're not moving towards that manual process, but we are thinking about digitization direct with things on, on in your facility. So again, the focus is probably going to be machine interface and that OT component. So let's, let's, let's do a recap. We've kind of gone through a few things here. We're already digitizing or we want to digitize in the future. That's, that's a key point to, to this presentation. We have no network, or maybe there's some networks already existing that are communicating between machines. We'll want to exchange data with machines. That's, that's a given based off the last slide. And we're also assuming that maybe that subject matter expert doesn't exist. You already have an OT guy. Awesome. Then, then you're probably ahead of the curve. Doesn't mean that you're not going to get anything out of this presentation. There's still things to consider. But a lot of times I see my clients have an IT person who doesn't have that foundational knowledge and understanding of potentially what may come across as, as machines expand and what some of those architectures are gonna to be to consider in the future. So let's get, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this presentation. So what do we need to do to future-proof our systems? So there's the scenario where things are already there. So obviously the biggest one is don't make the problem worse. Let's, let's take a look at, as you're going to make changes, what, what you need to do. And that's going to be subsequent slides. The other thing I'm going to really stress is gathering information now. And, and this is going to be a recurring theme as I'm going to go through. There's going to be a lot of key information that, that is going to be very pertinent to helping your future digitization initiatives, machine drawings, code, any sort of project documentation that came out of that. A lot of the times, that ends up existing with the OEM, with the guy who installed it, with that internal resource who put that documentation on a laptop. It's extremely important to centralize that information now so it's, you can refer to it later, later. And then there's a scenario where you are making changes to your systems and you're installing new things. So let's go through those good practices. So the main thing that I'm going to stress is setting internal and external requirements for these six items. It's, this is not the most comprehensive list. It's not everything you could possibly do, but it's a very strong starting point that it can save you a lot of money down the road. So we're gonna dive into these. So network architecture, what does that mean? These are gonna sound like complex concepts to start with for those that don't have networking backgrounds, but we're gonna go through a slide that's going to show you this visually. We're gonna to refer to all these points coming back. So. No point-to-point -point runs between control panels and devices on the primary OT network. Your, your primary OT network is going to be the place where you want most of your things living uh, that, that are smart devices like your PLCs, like your computers. PLC to IO panels are okay on IO subnetworks. We'll, we'll show you what that means. No point-to-point -point runs between IO panels. So again, point-to-point -point runs in general, we want to keep down to a minimum. So that, that, that concept is referred to as daisy chaining. We want, to, we want to eliminate that where we can. And pulling Ethernet back to central switches. So it's kind of taking this star topology concept that is a networking concept and, and uh, applying it. So why, why do we do that? One is reducing hops in device communication. Again, daisy chains that the less hops you have, the less points of failure, the less latency, um, the less gremlins that can come up on your network. Um, laying out physical cabling uh, to conform with future good practices and upgrades. Eventually, I see as my clients go through maturity cycles, they want to move 
to a networking model such as Purdue. It's not difficult to do if you have your conduit and your physical uh, things in place. You can always replace switches and things later, but having the physical infrastructure there from the beginning can save you hundreds of thousands of dollars down the road. And finally, less infrastructure changes in the future. So the more space and the more things you have in place to begin with, even if you don't have it at 100%, it'll only benefit you later. So let's go through what all this means. Hopefully we haven't lost anyone. So no point-to-point -point runs uh, between control panels uh, on the primary OT network. So we look at this network architecture drawing that we've taken a look at earlier. So what does that mean in this drawing? We got two connections here that are hopping through a PLC panel. We don't want to do this. What we really want to do is connect everything back up to a central OT or IT cabinet. We want to have things from everything on the OT network basically coming back up to that cabinet as far as panels go, with the exception of what you see in the middle where you have a PLC panel that has a switch in it and that's all self-contained within one enclosure. Now there's one exception here. You see that PLC panel is connecting up to that IO panel on the top right. So why? Because that, 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 those devices are sort of slaves to that PLC. You wanna have those connected directly to that panel. So there is one exception. If you have IO panels, it's okay to connect them back to a PLC panel. This, what I'm showing here is if you, the other thing that's okay to do is actually have remote OT panels. Again, we don't want to be jumping through PLC panels to other PLC panels or other computers or other OT main network devices, but having multiple remote OT cabinets is okay. Eventually, even if there is some daisy chaining going on there, that can be fixed much easier uh, using things like ring topologies in the future than what you could do if you're jumping through individual control machine panels. So the next thing we're going to talk about that touches upon what we saw there is segmentation. So some are going to argue that this is a nice to have. I think this is something that I, I recommend quite often because it has a few key benefits. But some will argue, some IT experts, OT experts will, will say there's other ways to approach it. There are, there's a lot of ways to do this, but to me, this is the simplest and easiest way to do if you don't have an expert on staff. So what does that mean? IO belonging to a PLC is segmented from the main network. What the implication of that is that you generally install PLCs with two network adapters. We'll show a little slide on that in a second, but why do we do this? <clears throat> we want to reduce network traffic. So IO traffic generally only communicates to the PLC. So there's the justification for it. You don't need that on a general network. You only need it on a subnetwork that communicates to the PLC. IO is usually programmed through the PLC anyways. You don't usually go and change it uh, directly. So even if it is programmed directly though, you only usually program it when you install a machine. Usually you're not changing those end IO points you're changing things in the PLC. And finally, IO, again, with IoT and some other concepts, IO can be a direct source of data, but generally it's a secondary source of data. Generally, you're contextualizing that data within a PLC first. Not always, but, but generally. So we go, back, we go back to this picture that we just saw a second ago. So we fixed up some of our, our uh, daisy chaining going from PLC to PLC panels. Now we have a PLC panel in the center with a IO panel on the side there. So what, what's wrong with this picture? When I click the next button here, uh, I'll just eliminate some of the riffraff that you guys don't need to see. When I click the next button here, you'll see in the center panel, what we did is we've added a second adapter to that PLC in the top left corner of the center panel, and we've added a secondary switch. Now all those IO devices that were there previously connected to that main network are on a segmented network and they only communicate to that PLC. You've now reduced traffic. You've, you've, you can now just uh, add IO to that network without potentially affecting anything on your OT network and, and a few other benefits. So now we're gonna jump into one of the heavier concepts of this. So again, hopefully I haven't lost anyone yet, but you'll have these, this presentation to refer back to with the, with the graphics and everything after this presentation. So, one thing you want to do is create a standard for your OT network and how you're going to approach IP addressing within your facility. What that means in practice is you want an Excel spreadsheet. 
pretty pretty simple. What that what that in, the implication of that is though is that as anyone is installing devices, that means OEMs, any key installers that you have, internal people are installing things on your OT network. Everything, every IP address needs to be designated from that master spreadsheet. The other thing we're going to do is create a primary OT network and some unique subnets, as we did with the segmentation for your IM networks. Why are we going to do this? Well, the first obvious one is having a master log for all your IP addressing. IP addressing is required, the IP address is required in order to communicate with devices. It's sort of like the, the, the key to being able to say where something is on your network. Without that, we can't communicate. So actually knowing that is a huge problem with a lot of the clients I work with is that they don't even know what that is. And it can be difficult to figure out later. The other real risk is that even connecting to a network often requires assigning yourself an IP address. And if I don't know what's on that network and I just want to even scan it to see what's there, there's a risk of myself duplicating an IP address and then taking something down on your network. So having that list lets me know exactly which ones are free and what can I assign to my own computer. The other thing is it future proofs the network because it allows everything to communicate as you'd expect. So before we get into some of the graphics and showing everybody what this means and what that Excel spreadsheet looks like, I'm going to do a very, very quick overview of what IP addressing is. So we've talked about that primary OT network, assigning it a subnet. Usually there, there, people will assign one of three subnets. There's a 10 dot subnet, as you can see on, under the second bullet there, there's a 10 dot X dot X dot Y. There's another subnet 1.2.168, which a lot of people's home routers will give them. And then there's a 172.16, which is a lot less common than the other two. These are, these are defined by the International Standards Boards, IANA, IETF, uh, as private subnets that you can use on your own private networks. So everybody uses these. Like I said, your own computer has it. Every factory kind of uses these. Um, generally, my recommendation is you use the 10 dot. It's the biggest subnet. It's the biggest private subnet you can use. And it's generally a very common one that everybody sees and understands immediately that that's a private subnet. Um, there's examples of how you can apply that. So on the bottom bullet, you can see a private subnet could be 10.0.1.something, 10.1.1, 10.30.0. That X can be anything you want, where Y is between 2 and 254. So OK, again, a, a lot of things. But we'll, we'll get into it and we'll simplify it. So let's take a look at this graphic here. This is your primary OT network. So we've already alluded to it. You've separated out your I.O. on the top right corner, and now you have your primary OT network. This is where all your devices live that you want to be communicating with and that want to communicate with each other. As you see on the top corner, on the top right there, I've uh, top left, sorry, I've, I've designated that as the primary OT network, and I've assigned it that 10.0.0 subnet. So now that we've established that, let's go into what does your IP addressing standard look like? It's an Excel spreadsheet. In the first column, you put in the subnet, which is 10.0.0, followed by all the addresses in that subnet, which range from 1 to 254. You'll see I've purposely reserved 10.0.0.1, and the dot one of any subnet will always be reserved, the default gateway. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Just trust me on that. Just always reserve that one as you're creating your spreadsheet for the default gateway. You designate a tab for that primary OT subnet, and you see you put in the 10.0.0.x, signifying that all the IP addresses will start with that there. And as we jump into the next tab, the next step is really just assigning these IP addresses to everyone in your, in your, in your facility. So as something comes onto your network, whether it's an OEM installing a machine, it's a uh, it's an internal resource, a maintenance person installing a sensor or installing another system, a computer. You want to be assigning IP addresses off of this list. They're going to come back to you with certain information that you're going to need. You don't need to, you don't need to uh, fill in this information yourself. All you need to do is get them to come back to you with this. Your only job here is to uh, delegate out the IP addresses as they're required. Things they're going to come back to you with is subnet mask. It's usually going to be 255, 255, 255, but if it's different, 
the installer can update that. As you install things, you're going to want to say this is now in use. So that's something you would update and say that the status of that IP address is in use or reserved potentially. MAC address is a unique identifier specific to the uh, network port of that device that's being installed, which the installer should give you. Description, self-explanatory, the installer should be able to update that. Part and model number, again, installer should be able to give you that. And then very important is the location. Generally, any panel that you put down on the floor, whether it's a network cabinet, whether it's a machine panel, what have you, is going to have a number or it should have a number associated with it. If it doesn't, put one on it. Make sure you log that number so you know exactly what is where a device is in which panel and vice versa, which panels contain what devices. There's also an asset ID. This is just good practice that I recommend for, for people uh, as, they're, as they're developing their own internal standards, just so that they can identify assets uh, from an internal nomenclature standpoint. And that is basically it. Your, your job as a project manager, as an operations manager, as a whoever you are in your organization is simply to bookkeep that. And anytime an installer comes in, regardless of who it is, they need to understand that they need to come to you to get that. This is very common in the IT world. It's, some, it's not a foreign concept. It's just something that people within the manufacturing space don't do well. So we've talked about the primary OT network. We've, we've basically given you the, the tools you need to bookkeep and, and make sure that you understand what's happening on your network on the OT side. So what about this yellow box that's here now? The, the IO, these, these other network segments that we've talked about that aren't connected to the primary network. Well, it's basically the same process. You just assign another subnet to it. So in this case, you'll see we've assigned 10.0.5. We've created a tab in column A. We've updated that with the five in the third uh, in the third octet. And the rest is just bookkeeping. You just fill that in. Following this process would save would have saved me over the course of my career probably months of labor that I've spent going through and trying to map out facilities just to make that Excel spreadsheet. Backwards engineering that is, is months and months of my lifetime that I've spent on multiple clients trying to do that. It, it's, it's a trivial activity that can be done. It takes a little bit of bookkeeping, a little bit of diligence, and it can save you tens of thousands of dollars down the road just to have that. Now we jump into device configuration. So I, I alluded to this uh, default gateway on that spreadsheet. So let's let's jump into that. So it's simple. As far as device configurations go, we, we kind of hit the point home. Everything is assigned out that spreadsheet. And your installers have to use the result, the, the reserve default gateway for the subnet that they're on. So basically every device as it's being installed on the network, this is not your job to do, this will be your installer. They'll have to set a default gateway. A lot of times they don't set it. They'll, they'll put nothing in there. What we want them to do. Is to, ins is to put in that default gateway uh, address. Now the question is, why do we need to do that? You, you may not even have a default gateway. This is future proofing. This is one day you're gonna have enough devices on your, on your network, you're gonna wanna implement security measures on your network, and you're gonna need to do things like routing. This is going to enable that. You're gonna be able to install those default gateways and make sure that you can actually achieve those things without going through and having to reprogram devices that you've already deployed. It's a one second activity that people do when they're installing devices, and that can save you a ton of time in the future. Um, and I, I've already alluded to the routing. So what does that look like? <clears throat> Let's go back to this, to this uh, picture here. Somebody's installing a device. We'll call this a line number one process PLC. Your installer comes in, they update all this, and all you have to do is tell them you're going to be installing the IP address at 10.0.0.3 and make sure that the default gateway is set to 10.0.0.1. That's it, and it can save you thousands of dollars in the future. Next thing is physical location. This one always, this one always gets me because this is probably one of the simplest things you can do, and it's often not done. So everybody's familiar with layout drawings. Everybody has layout drawings for, for their facility, uh, just showing an overview of where things are, where are the lines located, Updating those drawings with panel numbers is something that I, I see very, very seldomly, but having panel numbers there that 
correlate back to that location column in that standard, that, that, that Excel spreadsheet, would save us so much time trying to figure out where things are physically located. It, it it's, could be, again, days or weeks of time. So going into the why, again, these are, these are a little bit obvious, knowing where your assets are that contain that valuable data that you're gonna be looking for. And just, and just inversely, sometimes what happens is we do find assets on the floor, but we wanna know what they are. We wanna know what IP address they are. So using the inverse, you wanna know what, what's in your panel, but also what are the key characteristics of those devices within there. So very, very simple. As you're installing these devices, as your installers are going in, either putting things into existing panels or installing new panels, you update this and you update your overview drawing with those panel numbers. And you only have to do that if you have a new panel. If it's an existing panel, it should already be there. Again, weeks, potential weeks of time that could be saved here. And then finally, overall general machine requirements. So this is probably more so when you're making changes or installing new machines. Number one is the interface. There's been a lot of times that I've gone to client sites that are like, I wanna get, I wanna get data out of this machine, but they, don't, they didn't buy the option that allows them to get the ethernet port on the device. That's, that's what allows you to connect the cable. As you're going through and you're doing your procurement, make sure that you have that as a requirement from your teams to add that $300 additional feature on the machine to get data. The cost of retrofitting can be unbelievable sometimes. It can be you need to pull a panel off completely off a machine and send it back to the manufacturer so they can retrofit, which means that you have downtime for weeks. It could cost thousands of dollars to do. There's, there's a whole slew of things that can happen from that. Sorry, here, I think my, uh, my headphones are dying. Apologies. Okay, sorry about that. And secondly, the other thing is code backups. This is another thing that I, I would say 89% of clients I work with are, are guilty of is not getting code backups. So whether that's internal resources, making changes to machinery, installers coming in and putting in and, and deploying something. A lot of the times the most latest and greatest up-to-date code or any code for that matter is not available. So why do we need this thing? Why do we need these things? One, again, the ethernet interface is required for machine to pull data. It's usually a small cost upgrade and it will get you what you need in order to, uh, to, to integrate the machine later down the road. Number two, the code is generally required to access the data you're looking for. And number three, why we try to drive the point, anytime there's change made, get that backup because that might not be available later. It's, it's happened so many times to my clients where an installer has gone out of business, they lost that, the, the documentation, uh, that guy who installed it is no longer working there and it was on his computer. Happens all the time. And uh, it, it can be a deal breaker sometimes for actually taking on a digitization initiative on a, on a specific machine. So we've talked a lot about concepts. There's a lot we went through and, and you might be thinking like, wow, that, that, there's a lot to remember here. We've created basically a one page cheat sheet to review this. So when we talk about network architecture, we've talked about things like making sure you're not daisy chaining between panels. That in itself basically sums up what you need to do. You want to take on that star topology concept. So don't go between PLC panels and don't go between IO panels, but going between a PLC and IO is okay. And the cost of that, you may need an extra network switch. You may need to put a cabinet out in the field to pull your, your uh, systems to, but it's quite minimal. Segmentation. Keep your IO and your, and your primary network separate. Again, when an installer comes in or you're deploying something yourself, there may be a small cost associated with an extra communication card, usually a few hundred dollars. IP addressing, create a spreadsheet and just maintain it and, and make sure you're, you're doing your due diligence to, uh, to working with your contractors and your internal resources to use it. Device configuration, again, it, it, these are things that take seconds to do. And, uh, and are often not thought of or, or not followed. 
Physical location, again, it's as easy as updating a spreadsheet and updating a column, uh, updating a, a layout drawing and updating a column in a spreadsheet. And then finally, interfaces. Sometimes it's free to get the ethernet uh, adapter. Sometimes it's a few hundred bucks and getting the latest code changes. Again, that, that's free. That's something your, your, uh, your contractors and your internal employees should be able to do. So let's jump into the to an example project. So what I, what I want to do in these next slides is illustrate a real world example of what we go through on, on a monthly basis with our clients. I would say at least one a month I get that falls into this category. And, and here's some of the steps that we go through. So a client will come back and say, I want to do a digitization initiative. And again, they'll go back to any of these. Sometimes it'll be as simple as I just want something on a TV screen. I have five pieces of equipment I want to get data from, and uh, I'm going to ask someone, either internal, contractor, OEM, somebody to come and do this for me. So let's take a look at a hypothetical layout drawing. Again, layout drawing here. Let's say we got a few palletizers, we got a few checkwares, and a grinder that they want to integrate. So let's let's talk through the steps that I take when when a client comes back and says I want to do something with data from these machines. So step one is we need to find the data source, which is generally a PLC or, or it might be some other device on the floor. So first thing is physical location. If these standards and if these things exist already, we can identify where that device is from, that layout drawing, and we can look at the master spreadsheet to see what is connected, what is in that cabinet, what does that machine have. I can basically identify all the information I need from that from that system without ever stepping foot on site. I can get on a, on a Skype call. I can do it via email. If I have this information, I can tell them almost unequivocally uh, what is there just off of this information. If we don't have this information, what happens? So we need to physically get to site and inspect the panels. Uh, we may not know what network it's a part of. Uh, part numbers may not be visible, so I can see a part, but a lot of times you'll get a company that sells a part that has 80 different flavors and you need the exact model number. Sometimes I have to take a part. I got to shut down the panel. I got to shut down the machine and actually rip the thing apart so I can see the, 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 uh, the item number. A lot of the times I have to actually talk to the OEM that installed it. We got to set up meetings so that I can get information about it. And generally this does cause a delay, trying to get on site, getting an OEM involved, et cetera. And all this can be solved with a simple spreadsheet. Next thing we got to do is establish the feasibility of getting, getting data. So we've established, I know what's in the panel, I know what that device is, but can we get data from it? Sometimes it's very simple. You look at the part number and you say, absolutely, we need that data. Other times we got to do things like look at the PLC code. We got to look at how the machine was programmed and what data it has available. Sometimes we know what's in the panel, but that machine was not, uh, not installed with common uh, interfaces so that we can get to it with Ethernet. So again, that goes back to the machine requirements. So if everything's there, the client sends me the PLC code, I can look through it and I can tell them we can do exactly what they're looking for on their TV screen that they want um, production data from for. If the standard doesn't exist, what, what, do, we, what do we do next? So uh, we may find out that the machine wasn't installed with a data interface. So we may need to go and retrofit that machine, which, can range from a few hundred to a few thousand dollars, zero downtime to multiple weeks of downtime. Uh, we would need to physically go to the panel and attempt to pull the PLC code. Uh, the code may not be commented or compiled in a way that we can read it or interpret it. Um, we may need to go talk to the OEM again and get some of those original code files if they exist or get more information about the parts being used. Uh, there may be a chance that we need to buy special software because the OEM uh, set it up that way. Again, multiple delays that can come just from the feasibility, that's step two of what we're trying to do. So let's say we've, we've established feasibility, we've gone through the PLC code, we've established there's an ethernet connection, we know where it is, we know it belongs to that machine. So then we move on to step three, and generally that comes back to us having to deploy a piece of software, kind of going back to that, to one of the core components of what we need is software. So we go and say, we're gonna go deploy a little computer, server, whatever on your network to go and pull that data. When the standard exists, 
all your PLCs are connected to a singular primary OT network. We install the server and we connect up to all your PLCs. Very, very simple, very straightforward. Standard doesn't exist. Uh, sky's the limit on possibilities that can happen, but some of those include, we may need to map out the facility to understand the interconnections of your network. Sometimes some of your networks may be connected, some of them may not. In our example, we have palletizers, check wires, and a grinder. The palletizer and check wires might be connected and the, the grinder's not. Uh, we may need to install new conduit and networking hardware. Uh, we may need to assess whether this is even feasible from a financial standpoint. Um, there's times where we refit wireless solutions. Um, in any situation, if we get to this point and we don't have some of that core networking, you almost unequivocally need somebody who has knowledge in OT network to come in and architect the solution. And of course, at that point, you're going to have to be making infrastructure changes and the potential delays for weeks to months. Next one. So again, infrastructure wise, we're good. Let's say, let's go, we've, we've successfully done step three. Now we have to actually, from a software standpoint, connect up to those machines. So if the standard exists, we have that spreadsheet. We know the IP addresses. We can avoid duplicate IP addresses. We can assign IP addresses to that server and the default gateway is configured on all your end devices. So in the scenario where you do have some more complex networking that comes in, we gotta do some routing, we gotta do some VLANs, we gotta do other things. We have a default gateway where we can route through. If that standard doesn't exist, we will likely need to do network scans. We'll need to understand how that network's architected. Um, we may not have any idea how to connect to the network to start the scanning process. That, that is a very real scenario. Um, again, we have potential duplicate IP address risks. We may need to reconfigure default gateways on every single device, which can take, which can create downtime depending on how the device works and could take multiple weeks to do depending on how many devices are on that network. Uh, we may need NAT devices. We may need network address translation, which I'm not, I'm not even going to get into. Uh, but we need more hardware just to translate IP addresses for us. Or we may need to completely redo the IP addressing schema, which is a large amount of work, which is go and do what we should have done from the first place, which is go and assign things from a spreadsheet the way they were supposed to be assigned. And that is a project I've taken on multiple times where we've come into factories and basically taken everything down and re ip everything. Finally, let's say all that worked. We have the servers, we have data flowing, Everything's working great. So let's go through a hypothetical scenario where we need some additional metrics that aren't existing there. We need a temperature sensor on the grinder because we, we, we feel like there may be something we wanna, we wanna get from that. If we know, if we have the standard, we already know what's on that IO subnet and we know what the IP addresses are. Again, we can avoid the duplicate IP address problem and we can very easily add it to that IO network. The network traffic is segmented as well, which is a key benefit where if you're doing something on a subnetwork, only that machine would be affected if something were to go wrong, it's an isolated network. If you take down a network or something in a panel where you're daisy chaining connections across a machine, if you take down that panel, you, you basically take down your whole network. Standard doesn't exist. Again, we're back on the IO layer. We have to do network scans. We don't know how the network's architected. Um, we'd have to be adding process level devices or IO devices to an unknown network. We don't know what the stability of that network is. We don't know what the troubleshooting steps will be if something goes wrong and we can exacerbate existing underlying issues. And again, we go back to that duplicate IP address risk. So those are, those are all the key things that you get in that scenario and hopefully relating all that back to every single standard that we've defined makes sense. So, I'm going to conclude this presentation with a few with a few thoughts. This is not an exhaustive list of good practices. It's not everything, but it's a few key things that if you have this in place as you go through your maturity life cycle, as you decide to take on digitization initiatives, you will have enough information to get things moving off the ground without needing additional investment. A lot of the steps here can be done without an expert. You do not need to be a network expert. A networking expert, you don't need to be the OT expert. All you have to know is how to assign it to subnets, basically. 
All you have to do is arbitrarily choose something that starts with pen dot and put it into a spreadsheet and then do the due diligence of assigning it to people. There's a few things we address through these recommendations. We address the physical network infrastructure. So again, we look at physical topology and conduits, which even if we don't get everything perfect on the first go, replacing conduit in the future, doing multi hundred foot runs in the future can be extremely expensive. And it's something you can get right on the first go if you have that standard and, and physical um, layout in place and, and requirements for your network architecture. The other thing we address here is your logical topology. So again, how you're, how you're dealing with interconnections, IP addressing, default gateways, all those things are addressed here and set you up for the future when you go through a much more mature network architecture or if, if you choose to implement it. And finally, there are more steps to get the perfect setup. But as we all know, there's always budgets associated with projects. There's only so much uh, you can do within one initiative. So these things are low cost, a lot of them are free, and they can reduce up to 90% of costs with the future when you're retrofitting or getting yourself up the next step in the maturity lifecycle. And that is it. So hopefully I didn't lose too many people on this and hopefully there's some, some value that people have gotten from this. So uh, I guess I can, open things up to uh, to questions now. Some of you folks have, have been talking about how, again, there's there's a little, little resources. You don't necessarily have project management. You don't have an OT person. You don't have uh, somebody that's necessarily um, looking after uh, some of the different uh, categories or requirements that Arthur talked about today. So out of the six categories that Arthur went through, which one seems to be the biggest pitfall for our customers? Okay, yeah, I, and, and it would seem to me, uh, specifically the IP address uh, requirement seems to be the easiest one, but the biggest challenge for most of the folks uh, that you've dealt with. Yeah, I, I think IP addressing is a, is a big uh, piece, which again, seems scary and, and can be complex for some people, but it is one that, that definitely ties the threads between all the devices that you have on your network. Even, even um, we can infer a lot of information about how your network is architected just by looking at a spreadsheet like that. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's very, very low hanging fruit that I would say is a, is a key challenge for a lot of clients and, and something they don't have. They may have things like code backups. They may already have things connected to a network, or they may already, in fact, be collecting data and have done some digitization initiatives. But the problem is that there's no documentation actually showing how anything's interconnected. So making an incremental change is almost, you know, not, not impossible, but but very tricky. Yeah, well, that, that brings up maybe the, um, and, and maybe this is completely hypothetical, but you, you have different OEMs or different uh, project folks that come in and out of a facility over the course of its lifetime and there's batches upon batches of, of different implementations going on and again because these are from different groups different mm -hmm. projects all of this stuff is just siloed and not easily found yeah. uh, do you have any i guess best practices around consolidating some of the projects and putting it into a more centralized repository so people have more visibility to what's actually connected and what's actually going on in terms of um, communicating with all the devices, systems, and technologies. Yeah. So yeah, that's a great question, and and I think we we've kind of touched upon some of those concepts when we talk about segmentation. What what happens often, and and maybe some people can relate to this, is that um, you get people and installers, and there can be multiple projects going in at the same time. And you do end up getting fully segmented machinery and networks and things that form on their own organically, simply because there is no key person who is driving that standard of you need to be assigning and you need to be doing things per this spreadsheet, even that, that we've called out. That, that, that is something that, that happens very organically. It's just because people don't ask the question. And, and that's really the culprit behind this is that a lot of people come in and a lot of, you know, it's it's just a simple thing to skip over because it'll work and the outcome is still, you're getting your your bottle line running, your fillers are working, your process is working, 
but you don't you don't really see the 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 um, the detrimental effects of not taking on a standard like this until you want to use data from from those systems. Going through and having somebody that that's appointed with this task and it's not an easy thing. I think out of anything here, um, that is actually the hardest part is consistently. Uh, you know, applying what we've talked about here. It's not, it's not the, the, the concepts or the, uh, or the actual act of doing it, but like you said, project managers change. Um, people's roles within an organization change over time. Who's actually administrating and doing this? So there is a component to all this that, that I really, really want to drive is that, you know, there is a, a effort here that needs to be taken on. And that can be as simple as, you know, somebody is is designated as that person and they're involved as a stakeholder within those projects and that stakeholder role can be very very tiny it could just be when we start talking about the implementation of the system this person needs to sit in here and and voice their uh requirements with that oem with that installer with that in, in, internal initiative mm -hmm. just driving that just that one 10 minute conversation uh, can really drop uh, can really drive the adoption of all these standards right well yeah at least on the IT side right there's always the risk of um, shadow implementations or, or you know there's right. there's other departments and teams that are just putting in new software and then you know what what's the ripple effects from that if you don't have an OT department that's that's going haywire <laughs> so so going going back to one point you said around network architecture, reducing network hops, and I think you gave a, a couple of examples of that. But you know, for somebody who again isn't uh, necessarily an IT or OT type person, uh, that that might be a hard concept for them to to think through. Mm -hmm. So do you have any advice to help guide folks around you know eliminating the unnecessary connections to just create a more streamlined uh, well connection? Yeah, and I mean. I, I I can sympathize with the the folks that um, can be tasked with this that may not have the you know the background of of networking and it can be a lot harder um, to your point of actually trying to get that adoption again. What I think the the fact of the matter though is is that these people that are coming in and doing this work understand what you're saying even if you don't have that background and expertise even as simply as getting something down on a piece of paper, even just transcribing what I, what I put in this presentation and putting it down as a requirement set. Um, oftentimes you can go and, and give that to an installer, give that to that OEM that's gonna be coming in to the line integrator to this, to your internal guys. They should understand what that concept is, that it, it's, a, it's a fundamental networking concept. And, being able to drive that through that and saying, hey, you, you need to conform with what we have down on this piece of paper, that should initiate them to go and make the tweaks and little changes that they're going to need to conform with that. And then they'll, they might come back and ask you, well, okay, we were just planning to make this little island of, of devices here, but you're saying I, I, we need to connect up to your, to your main OT network. Uh, where, where is that? They may ask you, where's the cabinet location? Where's, how do we connect into that? And they'll say, well, you said I need two network cards because you don't want the IO on your, on your main OT network. Okay, I know what that means as an installer. Okay, you gave me an IP address. Okay, I know what that means as an installer. You gave me the default gateway. I know what that means as an installer, but what do I connect to? So that might be, you know, in my opinion, as hard as the questions get is they, they're gonna have follow-up. There's gonna be subsequent things, but Again, even with some of the, um, you know, the, the hesitance that a person may have with trying to, um, to, to uh, you know, push kind of some of these standards, it's not terribly difficult. And the people that are working on it should know how to address those things 99% of the time. And really the subsequent things would be like physical location of your, of your network cabinet. So I know, I know it's sort of a leap of faith that I'm kind of asking for here and, and saying that, you know, it, it, it is not something that may be intuitive for everyone, but the people that you're going to be surrounded with, it will be something that they'll, they'll know how to do. So hopefully that addresses that. <laughs> 
Yeah, and and I appreciate the cheat sheet or the one pager that you uh, you had a couple of slides back. I think that's going to get a lot of folks on this call started at least with the conversations. Um, Arthur, I know we're running out of time, so if you don't mind, we'll, we'll just go to the next slide because I know your contact information is on there. I think that would be a good way to end this presentation because there's going to be a lot more questions when it comes to actually uh, when the rubber meets the road and you're trying to figure this stuff out. Arthur's information is right here. Arthur, we really, really appreciate you coming on. This was some pretty deep dive stuff, at least in my opinion, and I, I think you made it a lot easier for, at, at least again in my opinion, for us to understand what's necessary to save a lot of time. Those examples were outstanding, by the way, and of course, uh, any future uh, expense to fix some of those errors up front. So I appreciate it. Um, please do send Arthur an email, or you can send an email here at Safety Chain, and we will forward that on. Uh, any question that we didn't actually address during this session will be addressed offline. So thank you everybody for your participation. So um, wonderful having you on, Arthur. We certainly want to have you come back and share some more of your stories. Thanks, everyone. Okay, have a great day, everybody, and we'll see you next time on Beyond Compliance.